For the Warriors Whiteboard Wednesday, that's Shehan Miller here from Warrior Concepts. And so we're just going to jump right into things. So uh, if you saw all the little slides and stuff I put out before this one, uh, I threw up this emoji because I can see people scratching their heads. I know I was when I was first introduced to this. But what we're looking at uh, this week is evasion without evading. What the hell is that? Right? Had, had, anyway. All right. So uh, let's start off with uh, discussing a problem. Right? So when people learn to fight, Typically, right? I don't care if you call it self-defense, martial arts. Uh, they're watching other people do it so they can, you know, get into a slugfest, been into a couple of things in high school, whatever, right? When when they learn to fight or when they're trying to learn to fight, right, they obviously want to have an advantage. And people can come up with all kinds of advantages, right? They, they choose different styles because that's supposed to kind of approach things from a different direction than the other person has seen, all those kind of things. It's all good, right? But one of these advantages or one of these tricks or whatever that people try to develop is what I call this little bait and switch game, okay, um, where they present a target only to pull it away, okay? So we'll take a look at a couple of those in a minute. Um, so these aren't really a problem, right? They work sometimes, okay? So before we jump into this too far, let me kind of illustrate this where – it all works fine until the other person that you're facing has seen it before, knows what you're doing, uses those kind of tricks, right? Or has done a little bit more than average training or has a little bit more than average experience, okay? So let's talk about Chuck Norris, right? Everybody likes Chuck Norris, okay? I'm not here bash Chuck Norris or anything like that, right? But we're gonna talk about Chuck Norris's competition fighting career, right? Which was actually fairly short-lived, right? Everybody knows about his decades of martial arts movies, right? But most don't know that much about his career, okay? So when Chuck Norris came on the competitive martial arts fighting scene, okay, he was the only Korean stylist, okay? He was the only Korean stylist. So he was up against all these other fighters, right, were trained in Japanese styles, okay? So these Japanese stylists were not used to the bobbing around, the big high kicks, these flashy cut. They weren't used to those kind of uh, techniques and tactics, okay? And so it allowed him to win consistently, right? Until he did, right? And he retired right after his first and only loss, okay? But the person that he lost to was another Korean stylist, okay? So he had the edge and he had the advantage doing these things, right? As long as the other person had no experience with them, okay? So we need to be careful, right? If you look at comments under my, my video, some of them are quite humorous, right? Um, if you if you look at any of those, right, you will if you know what you're looking for, you should be very you should very quickly be able to read somebody's personality type, what they're afraid of, what they're concerned about, those kind of things. Least of all, their ability to make a snap judgment about something they see over a couple of seconds. They don't understand it. So. Right. And all they can base it on and all they can translate things from is their past experience. Right. I mentioned often about this uh, quote from a guy named Bertram Russell. Uh, he was a philosopher and a really, really smart guy from the early part of the uh, 20th century. And he said that any report given by I think he used words like idiots or morons or whatever, but we'll just use the term less intelligent or less experienced person about something that a more intelligent, more intelligent, more knowledgeable, more experienced person says or does, right? They're, so their report or their, their, their conveying of this thing, okay, is always going to be flawed because they can't help unconsciously or subconsciously translating that thing, that verbal lesson, that visual thing that they saw, that martial arts demonstration or whatever, they can't help but translate it in a way that they will understand, 
Now, I'm using the word they to depersonalize, but we all do it. So, but the biggest thing that happens with a lot of these folks, and we have to be careful that we're not doing it, okay, is instead of asking an enlightenment inducing question, we jump to the conclusion that our translation gave. And so we find fault with it. So if we're really looking to learn, if we're really looking to pro progress, if we're really looking to be able to handle that kind of thing, instead of making assumptions and saying, well, that doesn't work for all of these reasons, but we've never done it. We've never tried it. We've never faced it, but we make a lot of assumptions. Instead of doing that, a better question would be, hmm, how does that work? How can I use that? How can I make that work for me? What kind of advantage does that give? Okay. But people write themselves into the scene. And the other thing too, is they translate and then start knocking apart the whole technique based on being in a position where they see the whole thing. They watch the video and then they tear it apart. They watch the technique and then they tear it apart. But the reality is that an attacker facing you who's never seen that before won't have that advantage. They're not going to have, they're not going to have anything to handle it because they're going to have to deal with it on the fly. Okay. We're going to talk about this thing, uh, this, this, a little bit of the psychology as we move down again, I'm hitting this at a 30,000 foot view, kind of the hot air balloon of the blimp over the, the sports stadium. Uh, but you know, what we'll go into this in, uh, you know, another live training and whatnot. Right. So, but again, this bait and switch kind of thing, right? And we'll talk about a couple of these things here in a minute. Um, they, they certainly work often enough for people to keep doing them, right? But when they don't, shit can really go bad, go sideways fast, okay? But here's the problem, right? The problem with this kind of maneuvering, right? Because they look like they're doing some of the stuff that I'm talking about, okay? But the problem here is that they try to hold a position so that they can get in a shot when a shot presents itself, right? They, they hold a position so they can fight like everyone else, but they, they do things, well, here, here, let's do this, right? Here's a couple of ways that this looks, okay? One, uh, have you ever seen what I call the pigeon head, right? Where the person's doing this and they're like sticking their head out and then pulling it back, right? They're baiting this shot, Okay, but they're hoping that their flinch response doesn't overwhelm them so much that they get tagged with the follow up. Okay, or the other person hasn't seen it. So when they throw their face forward to bait, that's when he tags them because he's been there before. He knows it. Okay, another one. And again, these are all like nose to nose kind of positioning. Right. Another one is they're working around in range. Right. And they're doing this bobbing and weaving kind of stuff. So they know where the target is. So when the punch comes in, they're hoping to be able to, you know, bob and weave out of the way and get another shot in. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard uh, Murphy's law of combat. Okay. There's a whole series of these things, right? But one of those laws of combat is if the enemy's in range, so are you. Okay. In Ninja 2, we look at that and go, hmm, okay, how can I have skills, techniques, and, and strategies and tactics and whatnot that make him think I'm in range, but I'm actually out of range. So I'm out of range for his weapon systems and his way of doing things, but he's in range for mine. Okay. This is stuff that nobody wants to go into because it's too much hard work, right? It requires more than just getting out, put some gloves on and figuring things out by yourself. Right. Because you're only going to get as far as you can conceive. Okay, It's one of the reasons for having a teacher. Right. You can point out these other things anyway. Right. So there's a nose to nose. Right. Doing the whole bob and weave thing. And then the other one is the guys who kind of move around jackrabbit kind of thing. So they're moving into range, out of range, that kind of thing. Right. It's the same as the pigeon head kind of thing, the pigeon neck kind of thing. Right. You know, this kind of thing. Right? It's the same as that, but they're doing with their whole body. Problem with that kind of movement is you can't steer and maneuver until both feet are on the floor. Okay. So every time I'm off the ground, 
with both feet, or at least with one where I'm stepping or, or uh, I'm stepping or kicking, I can't get out of that space. Okay. And what we want, one of the, one of the goals that we want is to have this freedom of movement. Okay. So um, again, all of these things work. If they didn't work, people wouldn't keep doing them, right? They work often enough. I say they work sometimes, okay? But when they don't, again, it's disastrous, right? So what we're going to talk about today is understanding space, right? And how an opponent targets your body parts. And this actually happens subconsciously and unconsciously. We have a glimmer of there's an opportunity, but the way we do things, because a fight is so fast, the way we do things, it, it's all muscle memory, right? We don't have to think about how to reach out and grab a hold of somebody's jacket or their their throat or punch them in the face or whatever, okay? But this original intent is really, really important, okay? The way they do it and what they're targeting is really important, okay? So how, the, how, how an opponent targets uh, your body parts, right? This is a principle from the Gyoko school, the Koto school, the Togakure Ryu, uh, most of the schools within the Bujinkan, okay? And if it's not a primary principle, it's in the important pieces, okay? So uh, in the Gyoko school uh, and the Koto school, the first kata on the first scroll of both of those schools, uh, the feeling in those techniques, right? The feeling in those kata. In the Gyoko Ryu, the first kata is called Koku, means false void. Can also be translated as tiger sky. But the feeling in that is to play in space. In the Koto school, the first uh, kata on the first scroll is called yokto, okay, to scoop up and throw, I think. Um, but the feeling in that one is to find the way, right? The whole principle of the Togakure school, right, well, our oldest ninja school, is find the most natural way, right? It's the wildflowers of the meadow uh, uh, poem that uh, Takamatsu would say, wrote as a way to sum up this whole principle, right? Shinden Fudo Yu is all about nature, all this stuff, right? So how how do I do this, right? So um, you know, let's do this. Last night during uh, the coaching call with with uh, my Platinum Inner Circle guys, we were discussing this Uke Nagash. Uke Nagash is, most people translate it as blocking. It's a receiving stop. It's a way to neutralize an incoming attack, that kind of thing, right? There's a whole bunch of ways to do that. Uh, I've covered a bunch of these things in uh, previous uh, Whiteboard Wednesday strategy. So you go to the YouTube channel uh, and you click on the live button, you'll see all those things. We also have a playlist, so it's probably in there. Or if you go to online ninjaacademy.com forward slash, um, well, you know what, Whiteboard Wednesday is not over there. Belay that. My coot ends over there. Anyway, uh, but just go to the the YouTube channel, go to the live thing. You can find all these things, right? So, but last night we were discussing these things and what I was, the, the crux of the lesson was how each of these schools does this thing, right? To catch somebody, to break their balance, to open up windows of opportunity, that kind of thing, right? And so we broke it down into like three core principles, right? Uh, and looked at a bunch of different things. And one of my guys, rightly so, said, Sensei in a fight, like, how do I know which one to do? Okay, how do I know which one to use against this guy? Well, what I had to share with him is that there's a whole bunch of preemptive stuff that comes before. Okay, it's kind of like, uh, you know, when we think of somebody who was who just like was an overnight success, whether it was a rock star or an athlete or uh, I think the, the reference I gave last night was J.K. Rowling's, right? Comes out with the Harry Potter novel, and it just fucking, boom, it just blows up, right? Wow, overnight success. Yeah, no. What nobody sees is the 10-plus years of research, writing, submitting, uh, you know, sample chapters to publishers and getting rejected, all the while working as a waitress. Uh, nobody sees that stuff, right? And that's the same thing that goes on when we're looking at kata, or we're looking at somebody who really knows what they're doing or one of these couple of second videos in the YouTube shorts or whatever, right? They don't, they don't see all the stuff that goes before that, right? One of those is just doing it a lot and, and getting experience, right? Because there's a certain feel to it. Other ones uh, have to do with getting really, really good at your kamai and your evasion, right? So we're talking about evasion here, but I mean like big overt evasion, right? Where you get really, really good at that, but what you're really getting really, really good at 
is you're getting really good at being difficult to hit or grab or kick, right? Most people don't want to do that, right? Ego wants the cool feeling of being able to drop somebody or drive them into the ground or whatever. When if you don't get really, really good at not being able to be hit or grabbed or kicked, you may not get to your cool finish, okay? So we have to circumvent ego. I would say sometimes, but quite often, right? So we get really, really good at that. So when he throws those first couple of things and I'm just avoiding, I'm paying attention to his fight style. I'm paying attention to how he does things because then I can pick and choose my techniques and my skills based on him and not based on my preferences or what I want to do or my favorite techniques or all that other bullshit that ego drives. And then, you know, either works or it doesn't. Okay. And then uh, building on top of that, right. I'm going to make certain assumptions based on my assessment of what he's doing. Okay. But there's still a lot of things I don't know. So in the next couple of moves, I might try one or two of these. And I'm now that I'm touching him, I'm going to feel how tense or heavy or whatever he is. And that's going to help hone things down so that when I do that move, now it's going to look like, oh, wow, that was really cool, man. He threw that and you just, yeah, but what about the couple of seconds to two minutes that went on before I caught that opening. Okay. It's not guesswork. It's not rocket science either. Okay. But it does require more in the way of thinking and assessment and stuff like that than just learning some cool freaking moves. But again, those of you that are on consistently or found this and you're still listening, right? Then you're probably looking for more than just some moves. Okay. So uh, again, you know, uh, what I covered with Mike was there's a whole bunch of other skills, soft skills, assessment, evasion, those kind of things that go on before you even try to do one of these things. Okay. So just like with that, this, there's a lot going on behind it as well. Okay. As a matter of fact, way back in the day, now this isn't the same book, but way back in the day, uh, my teachers, Hatsumi Sensei, Stephen Hayes, a bunch of these guys, right? They're like the best ninja manual on the market, right? You, you want to know what that is? And of course, people lean in. Yeah, what's the best ninja manual on the market, right? And then they said Gray's Anatomy or any other really good anatomy book where you can learn how the body works, where its limitations are, that kind of stuff. And then you can start implementing that in your training so that you can keep your body in the positions and in the condition where the body works best and well freedom of movement, that kind of thing. And you can force him to operate from weak positions and in ways that the body doesn't work, right? When I'm uh, doing certain techniques, I want to make sure that I'm operating where it's strong. When I'm applying a technique, I need to understand how to weaken his body or position it where that technique's going to tear his shoulder apart, even if he's two and a half times my size. Okay. So, but you don't get to that by making assumptions or fighting like everybody else, but better. Because even if you can do that, just like the Chuck Norris story, that's not only going to last so long. And even if you don't have somebody that comes along that knows your moves, we're all getting older. And eventually, you're going to be my age dealing with a 20-something, and you can't fight a 20-something like you're still a 20-something. You can try, right? I get it. Chuck Norris still stays in shape in his 80s, but he works out four times more than a 20 something to maintain that. Okay. Luckily he's richer than shit. So he's got all day long to work out like that. Most of us jobs, responsibilities, those kind of things. Right. So anyway, let's, let's keep going with this. Okay. So, um, in, in Sun Tzu's, uh, art of war, right. Um, now he's talking about a general battle, but this goes for anything. Okay. The, the, the quote is, if I know neither myself nor the opponent, I, if I win, it's going to be luck, right? That These are not Sun Tzu's words, but this is the reality, right? He says you're never going to win, but I say that, you know, shit happens. So you could win, right? Um, if I only know one or the other, right? If I only know myself but not him or I know him but not me, then for every win, I'm going to suffer a loss, 
okay? Only by knowing both, okay? Can I be almost invincible? He says I'm beatable, but I, I don't believe it 100%, okay? So anyway, so here's, here's the solution that I'm offering today. And again, this is based on my training, based on my, uh, my understanding, lessons I got from my teachers or whatnot, right? The implication is always, you do you, boo, okay? You can do whatever you want. I'm just offering some suggestions. And if they work for you, great. But as one of my teachers used to say, uh, you got to put it in to get it out, okay? So if you instantly dismiss this stuff or you never train with it, well, it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter if it's worked for me and 500,000 other people. If you don't put it in, it's not coming out, okay? All right, so, all right. Um, so what we're going to be taking a look at today, at today is, how to, is understanding how to hold a position and play with the space around you. The, the space that your body takes up and in the way that you can position your body to look like you're in one place, but not, right? You're not really there. I know, kind of odd, right? Okay. But the whole idea here is you're setting yourself up where you can evade a punch or grab or a kick. One, let's put these things up here, right? So we want to evade, punch, grab, kick, whatever, okay? Kick, bullet, right? If I put myself behind, behind bulletproof glass, he doesn't know it's there. He can see me. He can aim for the target, but he can't hit me, right? But it made a punch grab or kick or whatever, right? Um, without moving from the space you're in. You're in. Sorry, I didn't get a chance to set up the board as, as uh, pretty as I have over the past couple of uh, sessions or whatever. But... Um, so there, there's three different things here that I have for you, right? So first one, right, is uh, we're evading. I know I said evasion without evasion or without evading, but what I'm talking about is without moving, without having to move my feet. Okay, and we're going to talk about when that would when that would actually be, be really really useful here in a bit, all right? But We've all learned, you know, move, that kind of thing, right? So we understand evasion, and I am moving the target. I am making him miss. So there is evasion going on, but it's not this big footwork dependent kind of stuff, right? Okay. So the first one is uh, moving without moving my feet. Okay. Just talked about that, right? Without moving my feet. Okay. Two, I want to be able to do this in a way that brings him to me. Okay, so here's the thing, right? When we were talking about the pigeon net kind of guy or the bob and weave or the guy that's bouncing around or whatever, right? <laughs> I'm in range, but there's a lot of movement going on and so inertia and all kinds of things are working on my body, which makes it difficult to double back in the opposite direction. People get really, really good at this stuff, but they also recognize that, you know, we're trading shots because that's the game they're playing. Okay? They're playing the I'm willing to take one to get one. And the hope is the one I take doesn't shut me down more than the one he gets from me. It's a contest. Whose body can take more punishment? and last longer wins. That's that's the way it works, okay? But in the in the game of survival, okay? If you if you're just looking to fight that way, that's fine. You do you, right? But in the world of survival, remember, this guy's cut you from the herd, stacked his advantages against you, and you're starting from a negative and have to get to zero before you can even move forward. Okay? So these guys are not idiots, right? You're not getting into a ring where everything's fair. You both didn't do weigh in, so you're about the same, whatever, right? He's chosen the environment. He's chosen the time. He's okay. So again, I I want to be able to do this without having to move my feet in a way that brings him to me and 
uh, in a way that um, breaks his balance when he misses. Okay, breaks his balance when he misses. What is what does his broken balance do? Makes it difficult for him to avoid the thing you are about to do to him. Okay, so um, I probably should have told you at the very very beginning that. This class is actually based on lessons I got from the Grand Master along the way where it caused me to scratch my head, right? Where, you know, he would he would just it would just look like he was just standing there and then the person punched or grabbed and they missed. And you have to. You have to get past the belief because because of what it looks like that the attacker pulled their punch or intentionally missed the grab or that kind of thing, because they're not, okay? My teacher would smack the shit out of us if we intentionally pulled a punch. I watched him at a big seminar once, one of the uke that he brought from Japan intentionally missed. And after some Japanese discussion, kind of under their breath, he and the other master teacher that came along to help with that big seminar, Spent like 20 minutes kicking the living shit out of this uke that intentionally missed. And somebody that was standing nearby that understood better Japanese at the time than I did overheard the conversation. And the gist of it was, don't you ever, ever fucking pull a punch on me like that again. Okay? If you have to pull a punch on your teacher, one of two things are going on. Either your teacher sucks and you know it. And I don't know why you're still staying there, right? Or you don't believe your teacher can really do it. And so you're giving them the benefit of the doubt, in which case, I don't know why the hell you're there. Because when you're learning self-defense from, from a teacher, we, we, need to, we need to talk about the elephant in the room. And that elephant is you are putting your life in their hands until you reach a level of ability where you can do it for yourself. But your life is dependent on lessons, insights, whatever they give you. So if you're pulling punches because you know they can't do it or because you don't think they can do it or you got doubt, you need to want to do one of two things. Don't pull the punch and you'll know one way or the other whether they can do it or not. Or don't even bother with that step and go find another damn teacher. It's just what it comes down to. OK, so anyway, right. So I want to be able to do this again without moving my feet in a way that brings him to me. Right. Because if I'm not moving and he comes to me, say I'm not backing away, I'm not evading, I'm not changing the space around us that I now have to come back in and get it right. Not moving way back here that I got to come back. None of that. I'm it's like a it's like a trappers, those spring loaded traps that they lay out. And then the prey just takes the bait and steps in and it boom. Okay. That's what we're doing. We're setting up a trap, but we have to do it in a way that he doesn't see it as a trap. Okay. So again, th this is the goal. Okay. So this, this looks like we're doing pretty much the same thing. How is this different from the pigeon net guy or the bobbin weave or whatever? Okay. So the problem with the first method is that you're always in motion. And having to trust you, you're having to try to stay in front of his attack or his counter. Okay, you're playing the odds. Okay, in this way, what I'm doing is playing with something called original intent. Right, he will make a choice about grabbing something or hitting something based on where that thing is in space, based on his perceptions. Okay, you have to make his perceptions wrong. OK, so we'll talk about this shortly. Um, mm, will we? Sorry, I'm looking at my notes here. I want to make sure I didn't miss something. OK, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go back into that more. Uh, I'm going to give you some examples and stuff. Right. But let's do this. Uh, we'll be we'll be playing with uh, with a bunch of this stuff physically. So if you need physical examples, you can always sign up for the, uh, the, the uh, virtual class we have going on on Friday. Right. And see how I'm using it, how I'm doing it. I'm actually going to demonstrate some things today. I don't have a partner, but I'm going to show you this, this spatial relationship kind of thing. 
So even if you don't show up for the Friday's class, you can work it out for yourself. I hope. Okay. So, but let's do this, right? I made this, I made this old line drawing, right? Um, not that much of an artist. I used to be, but we're looking at this uh, character. If you're if you're in the Bujin Khan or you've been training for a while, you know this uh, Hira no Koma, okay? Hira, right? Long form of this is Hira Ichimon. Right? We just normally truncate it, right? Komai, posture, position, attitude, that kind of thing. Hira means flat or open. And Ichimonji, figure one, right? You're literally making a figure one, okay? Different from this figure one, okay? So Hira Ichimonji is flat. And there's lots of purposes for this. But the first thing I'm going to do is take a look at how this posture has all this stuff that we're talking about already built into it, okay? So remember I said about original intent, okay? What's this original intent? This posture is the first one I give to new students during their first class, whether it's a private class or a group class. First lesson they get is here, okay? Actually, the first lesson they get is this this chi tobi, this bunny drop kind of thing. So it doesn't matter if somebody's intentionally trying to hurt you or just screwing around and whipping something around, and you can drop and get under that thing and not get, you know, not swallow your teeth. But the first combat posture I teach them is this hit up, okay? So this looks really, really weird because most people in the self defense or martial arts world do this kind of a thing, right? Because you got to cover your head. Okay? My head's covered, it's fine. Okay, because there's lots of distance, right? But this thing, every time I've ever done this in front of conventional fighters, some of you have probably already said it. What's the problem? Well, you're wide open. I can kick you in the nuts, I can punch you in the gut, I can kick you in the head, but you're wide open. Okay. Yeah, I know what it looks like. Remember, we're talking about ninjutsu, and nothing in ninjutsu is ever what it looks like. So just because it looks wide open doesn't mean it is. Okay. It is, but in a different way. Okay, so, but this, the reason I give this as a first lesson is because I can de-escalate, I can try de-escalation tactics from here. Whoa, 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 hey, calm down. I don't have any problems, okay? Really difficult to do that from this position. You can do it, and he can hear your words, but he also sees everything else going on, okay? So, but let's go back to original intent. One of the questions I ask a new student is, where might an attacker try to get me? And they'll start naming things off, right? Punch you in the face, grab you by the throat, kick you in the groin, kick your gut, come in and tackle you, whatever. Absolutely, okay? So what we're talking about is, right? There's the box. That's what he's going to go after. So I start asking questions, okay? Is he going to try to punch me over here? No, Sensei. You're going to try to punch me over here? No, Sensei. You're going to try to kick me over here? No, Sensei. Yeah, you get the idea, right? Okay. Yeah. Look where I put my feet. I put my feet already in the safe zone. So I don't have to move my feet to evade. I simply flex a knee six inches and the rest of my targets move eight to 10. Okay. And I'm a wide guy. So if I can move mine, you beam poles can move yours. Okay. Original intent. What's he going for? This is set up so that my feet are already where I'm going to go. So I just saved myself some micro time because I don't need to step out of the way. I only need to move. Oh, use a different color here. I only need to move my body and its targets half their the half their width. That's some cool shit. Okay, so when a punch comes in or a kick comes in or whatever, instead of bobbing, which now torques my spine and kind of locks me up, and then I need to get back into position. Okay, instead of having to do that, I can just shift from foot to foot, and I'm on balance. He's right there, right? So I can shift, I can move, right? I don't have to, right? I don't have to be doing this stuff where I'm throwing body weight in a certain direction that isn't over my feet. 
Okay. So big example, but it points where we're going. Okay. So this works on the principle. I'm going to, I'm going to erase this. You guys will have the recording later on, unless you're taking notes at the moment. Okay. This works on the principle of uh, something called Kyojutsu Tenkan Ho. Let's use bullet white things, right? So Kyo Jitsu Tenkan Ho. That was not as important at the moment. Okay. So Kyojutsu Tenkan Ho. Okay. Um, so we'll look at examples of that in a minute and we'll also define it. But again, I've got people on that some of my local students join in and watch this. Uh, I got long distance people that watch and all that kind of stuff. But if you're not one of those folks and you want to have a custom training system, uh, you want to get coaching calls, virtual classes, you want to get help and guidance and whatnot, uh, just you can either post a comment below this or if you're on Facebook or whatever, you can do it there. Or you can send a message over to Warrior C at warrior-concepts-online.com. And just in the in the uh, subject line, just put call request, and we'll hop on the line, right? And we'll do a Zoom call or something like that, right? See where you are, see where you're going. I'm, I'll give you some suggestions for like next steps kind of thing, and we'll see if one of the programs are a good fit. But one of the reasons I do these and don't just let you sign up online, I mean, I guess you could, but um, is because I want to make sure it's a good fit. Because I've got lots of people that jump on these things, they jump on Kuden, they watch my videos online or whatever, right? Um, but they don't do any practice. They don't do any training. Okay. So one of the reasons for the, the things is, yes, you get to explore things. And yes, you get some free help. Okay. I'm not looking to, to enroll you into a program or whatever. If it happens, it happens. But I, we get on these things so I can help you out. But there's far too many people that want the training, but don't do anything with it. And I'm looking for people that are going to be good students. So part of the reason for this interaction before you're allowed to enroll is not just for you to check it out, but for me to make sure that you and I are going to be a good fit. Because people that are lazy up front are going to be lazy during the, the training of the program. Okay. Anyway, that being said, uh, if you want to do that, great. If not, no harm, no foul. Okay. So uh, let's break this down very, very quickly. Okay. So kill just ten con, right? Um, Everything in Ninjutsu is based on Kyojutsu Tenkan, right? Normally, we just kind of trade, uh, you know, explain this as a it's a switching truth and falsehood and whatnot. But let's just break it down really, really quickly, right? Whole just means method or way, okay? Kyo, right? And again, you'd have to know what the kanji are and whatnot. I'm not throwing the kanji up at the moment because we're already well into this, okay? Kyo, this is not the same kyo as teaching or uh, knowledge or whatever. This, the kanji for this kyo means a falsehood, right? Something that's fake, something that's insubstantial, right? And so, might be nice if I can spell it. Insubstantial, uh, yeah, okay? So there's nothing to it, okay? So it, it kind of points to an illusion, whatever, right? So uh, a lie, whatever, okay? Jitsu, right? This is truth. More specifically, okay, I don't play the game where people go, well, that's my truth. No, that's your opinion. The world is based on principles and concepts and, and universal laws, gravity, inertia, all those kind of things, right? We're either acting in accordance with those things, which smooths out our life and allows us to have greater power, or we're jerking ourselves around playing mental masturbation and coming up with whatever. So this is not personal truth. Okay. This is reality. I know people can play with that word too. Okay. But this is the truth of something. This is what's really going on. Okay. When I'm in Sega no Kamai or Ichimon no Kamai, right. To him, that's how far I can reach. But the fact that I get 70% of my weight on my back leg, the truth is that's how far I can reach. That makes all the difference in the world. If you can get your head wrapped around that, then instead of worrying about what he's going to throw at you, which you should always do anyway, but instead of being super weirded out about, you know, what he sees and how he might get in or whatever, just recognize that you're doing something, right? You know something he doesn't know, okay? Your reach is not where he thinks it is. 
he's willing to get that close because he's just out of range. He might even go after this, but this isn't stuck here because it's not a stance. It's hovering here. So when he goes after it, it's easy for me to move this because I know it's a potential target. I know he thinks of it as a target. Okay. So Jitsu and Tenkan means to switch. Oops, not stitch. Switch. Okay. To juxtaposition. So what this is telling you, this is the method of switching or interchanging truth and falsehood. So what you're going to do is you're going to present something that he accepts as real because he's basing all of his decisions, all of his actions, and all of his moves on it. But that's not it. Okay? Because you're presenting something that he's willing to buy. And when he takes it, you change. Okay? So let's look at a couple of examples. Right? So Hatsumi said they do this one time, and it took me a while to kind of figure this thing, thing out. Right? But what he did was he just stood here, right? Okay. I don't know if you can see what I just did. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna relax. Okay. Now I'm gonna turn sideways. Watch. See where my, the plane of my chest is. So if he's going to grab my shirt, it's right here. But when I relax, when I exhale, it's actually two or three inches behind that. So he will stove a finger at best, maybe snag something, right? but he's not going to grab where he wanted to grab. It's actually back here, but I'm going to present it differently. Okay. Another way to do this would be to turn like fending against things. And what I'm going to do, right? Because he's aiming for the edge of my body. Okay. Watch. I'm going to do this. Okay. I'm going to lift my shoulder. Watch the edges of my body. I'm going to lift my shoulder and my elbow. And I might even move my elbow out a little bit more. So see where it is? Right, I'm going to put my finger right here. Okay. Now I'm going to drop my shoulder. See the distance? Okay. So when he goes for it, right, this is what he's seeing. That's what he's going to go after. I didn't just drop it. The, ch the shape went from this to this. There's a gap. Okay. Another way to do this. Uh, I'm going to take up an, an Ichimoto. We'll just use this one, okay? So what you can't see, because I'm not far enough back here, is I'm going to take this foot. Here's I'm going to put myself in this position. See it? Now what I'm going to do, because my feet are this way, right? They're running this way. But what I'm going to do with my shoulders is I'm going to move my hips and shoulders over my front leg and turn my body this way. See where my, my target is in space? Remember what we said about the hira, right? It's not punching here or here right? He's punching here. Now all I have to do is relax the tension in my legs. I didn't have to step to get here. There's lots of ways to do this, okay? So the idea is how, to how do I present a target at one place in space? And it may even be uncomfortable to hold it there. My body's quite torqued to be in this position, all right? But when I relax, my body goes to where it's it can function well. See, the struggle is the illusion part. When I relax to where my body can operate really, really well, I'm already I've already slipped the punch, and I didn't have to throw this seven or eight pound bowling ball in a certain direction, which now I've got muscles over here trying to keep me from falling over. And I'm gonna fire, okay. So it's not that people can't do that well, but it's a lot of work. And that's not even the worst problem. The worst problem is everybody fucking does it. So everybody knows how it works. So now he'll throw jabs to get you to bob so he can nail you with the right cross. But if he's expecting me to bob and I shift not only sideways, but back, that right cross is going to miss too. Okay. This is what separates a technician, somebody who's good at moves and can do them really fast and really good at those things from a tactician, somebody who understands how to tactically control the battlefield and separates that person from a strategist who's got their sight on the long game. So we're going to do things a certain way 
to lead him to a certain outcome, which is what my law enforcement officers, my military guys, my security guys need, because the the outcome is no matter what's going on here, I need him over the trunk of a car, hood of a car, on his gut or whatever, so I can get the, get him into cuffs. And I either do things in a smart way so I can get him there easily, or we end up in a, in a wrestle fest. And if I'm in that situation, he can go for my weapon, he can go for my taser, he can go for... No, 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 no. Okay? Fight smarter, not harder. Okay? So these are just a couple of examples. We'll look at some other ones on Friday, as well as these, right? So here's the thing. When would this kind of a thing not only be useful, but it might be the thing that you have to do, okay? So I just have a couple of them, right? One, restroom stall, like a bathroom stall, okay? Uh, imagine, you know, you're, you're on a long drive, you stop at a rest stop, you stop at a truck stop, whatever. You go into a restroom because you got to do your business, right? You go into the stall, you turn to close the door, and this guy shoves that door open, and he's in that box with you. You're not doing all this movement, right? You're not, you're not, you know, jumping around. You're not even doing the you know, whatever, right? You're stuck, okay? Or have you ever parked in a parking lot, right? And I always try to park so that I'm, I'm, I try to be as mindful and as compassionate with people as possible. So when I pull in, because I, you know, a lot of us now have cameras, right? I don't just have a backup camera. My car comes with like a sense around kind of thing. So, you know, I'll pull in, double check the camera, make sure I'm as evenly placed between those lines as possible, okay? Because I don't want to infringe on other people's space, right? They're shopping carts. On top of that, I don't need my friggin' paint finish all scraped up and stuff like that. But that puts a decent amount of space between both cars. If they're parked that way and I'm parked that way, you should be, open, be able to open up your car door and not ding their car. Great. But have you ever done that? Pulled in, the car beside you or you picked a spot where you've got even space, you get out, you go in shopping, you come back, one of those people are gone, and the jackass that pulled in now is either riding the line or over on your side, and you've got to get in between that to get into your car, okay? Now, what if that jackass parked that way or somebody else saw it and recognized that as a perfect opportunity, so now you're in that wedge and you can't move your feet to avoid because you don't have room to step. All you have is this movement in here, okay? And the third one is, and again, this is a strategy kind of thing, right? Because we have to recognize most of us, unless you're living in a third world country and you're doing well for yourself, um, but technology hasn't quite caught up to the way these tyrants are fucking leading things, right? Okay. We live in a surveillance society. Back in the day, somebody had to be carrying around a camera, okay? And then they were in uh, ATMs, right? And then they were in ATMs and traffic lights. And now they're practically in every store pointing out because they have to worry about being robbed and every jack wagon is carrying around a, a supercomputer in the palm of his hand, right? That has a camera on it. And he wants to get it on his YouTube or whatever TikTok, Instagram, or whatever, when he sees shit go down, rather than call 911 and give somebody some help. Okay. So um, now you have a need. And from a ninja's perspective, we definitely have a need. If you're, if you got one of these things or higher, okay. Uh, if you think the legal system is going to be on your side and the DA or the lawyer that your attacker or his family is going to hire after the fact, to sue you for damages or get you thrown in jail for assault or murder or whatever. Um, if you think that they're not going to pull up your martial skills and make a case for, you just been looking for an opportunity to use this stuff, right? Cause you're just really a violent person, right? If you, if you, if you're ignorant of surveillance society, all this kind of stuff, or the agenda of a DA who has his sight set on running for governor, who's going to, he's, you know, going to make a stance on crime and he's going to turn you into a vigilante and throw your ass in jail. And then you got to worry about defending yourself against 10 guys, uh, you know, playing soap on a rope in the, in the uh, prison shower room. Yeah, no. Okay. So um, this would be a good thing to use when I'm, I have a need to, 
not look like I'm fighting. Okay, so I can I can bring some of this henso jutsu and, and other forms of Kyujutsu Tenkan in place, right? I may I may not be bothered by this person, but I need to, may need to present myself in a way. Uh, don't hit me, don't grab me, or whatever. So can you see that with the puffing or whatever, when this guy goes to grab and it's suddenly not there? I mean, he's already bringing himself to me to do it, to punch, to kick, to whatever, right? So I'm already handling the. He's coming to me. I don't or can't move my feet, right? So how do I get him to break his balance so he's busy fighting gravity, inertia, and himself in the moment that I do my move instead of fighting against me, right? I get him to miss. I get him because when, when we punch somebody, there's a subconscious recognition on the part of the body because you've done it before that you're going to run into resistance. So I'm doing things right? The body is, is already adjusting for that resistance and it's dependent upon it. Like picking up a box or a bag you thought was really heavy. So your muscles already start to engage to get ready to do work. And then next thing you know, it's not. And then you're picking up shit all over the floor because, right, your muscles overfired. That's what we want him to feel. Okay. So if I can get him to break, to Right now, not only did he come to me, right? Not only did he miss, but he's busy fighting gravity and inertia and all that kind of crap and not me. Okay. Anyway, so um, here's the thing, right? I gave you three different ways to do this. What are some other ways that you can think of, right? What are some other uh, ways that you can do this thing that I started off talking about, right? Evasion without evasion or evasion without evading really goes to i talked about gyoko school all that kind of stuff right another thing that another just way that you can think about this or call it is playing in and with space when i first heard that i thought how how woo woo it sounded but that's what we're doing your body has certain edges to it right he's he's targeting certain things to grab, to punch, to kick. But can you present things in a way where, okay? See what I did? So when you relax, you don't have to pull it away. Your body resets the center and now there's a four inch gap. Okay? So sneaky ninja bastards is what we are. Okay? If that's what you choose to jump on. Okay. Anyway, that's what I have. Hopefully I'll see you on the Friday virtual training. If not, no harm, no foul. But anyway, that's what I have for this week. I'll see you next week on the next episode of Warriors Whiteboard Wednesday. Be safe, train hard, have a good week.